Well, we're talking about peace today, right? And did you notice in your reading this week how many times the word peace came up? Wonderful coincidence, right? <laughs> I don't believe in coincidences. A wonderful God incidence that, that peace is throughout his word as we focus today on the Prince of Peace. So we're going to read John 14, 1 through 6. I know that's a little bit different than what it says in your uh, Bible through the year Bible, um, but that's, that's where we're going to take a look at today. Now, before I read it, how many of you know context matters when you're reading Scripture? Context matters. And one of the things we do each week when we study at our Bible studies is we talk about the context because it's important to know who, who, who's engaged here, who the recipients here, what's going on there, and what's God's word for them as well as for us. So it's important to look at the context. Well, John 14, I think that context matters a ton because where are we? What's going on? What are the circumstances of these words from the lips of Jesus in John 14, 1 through 6? Well, it's dinner conversation. It's a meal. And it's a meal with just the 12. So it's an intimate meal time, isn't it? And it's not just any meal. It's a farewell meal. It's Jesus' farewell dinner. And he says to them, basically, this is the last time we'll eat together on this side. And in that context, he speaks these words to 12 men who had to be troubled by that news. Hmm? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Well, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for these incredible words that the Holy Spirit has had preserved by the pen of John. Words that are just as alive for us today as when they were first written, as when they were first spoken by our Lord. Lord, even as we head to a meal today to meet with you in this Last Supper, I pray, prepare our hearts. Lord, I want to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, our teacher, whom you said not only would bring us comfort and peace, but would guide us into all truth. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, reveal the truth that you have for each one of us here today. Lord, I pray that I would simply be your vessel to glorify your name. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, my uh, boss, often when he went about, he started conversations with a question. I'm talking about Jesus. <laughs> Just so you're real clear <laughs> And Jesus, I love that how he modeled that, how often he would ask questions. Even there's a couple of questions here in our reading today. But I'd like to start off with just throwing this question out to you. Is being troubled a sin? 
Is it a sin to be troubled? Because Jesus begins this passage by saying, let not your heart be troubled. So is it a sin to let your heart be troubled? Well, context matters, but so does taking the scriptures all in context of what the whole word of God says. And I think the whole word of God says to us, no, it's not a sin to be troubled. And here's why I say that. Jesus was troubled. On numerous occasions, it talks about Jesus being troubled. When we did our reading last week, and we were back there in John chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus said, my soul is troubled. In John 13, 21, it says, and Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Now, Jesus never sinned. Jesus was the spotless one. So, obviously, you can be troubled. Your soul can be troubled. Your spirit can be troubled. And you've not sinned. So being troubled maybe isn't necessarily the issue. I think the issue is, what do you do with your trouble? I think that's the point of this passage is what we do when we're troubled. Because you know what? I have a hunch there's some people here today that are troubled. Hmm? And the question is, what will you do with it? And the other thing I thought about is this, is Jesus, when Jesus was troubled, he was troubled for the right reasons. Can you be troubled for the right reasons and the wrong reasons? Yeah, you can. And Jesus was troubled for the right reasons. I think we need to think about that. But Jesus was actually telling them, here's what you do when troubles come. So uh, the real issue is how are we to respond to trouble when trouble comes? And what does he say? One word. He says, Believe. Believe. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe. Believe in God. Believe also in me, he says. And I think we know that word believe doesn't just mean a mental consent, but it means something more than that. It means trust. It means putting your confidence in, putting your hope in. Listen, whatever trouble you're going through right now, God is saying, put your hope in me. Put your trust in me. Put your confidence in me. Trust me. And that's exactly what he was saying to these men who were troubled because Jesus was about to go to the cross. He was saying, trust. Trust God. Even in the midst of that. And so I would say to you today, I I think there's some here today, God is saying, will you just trust me with this? Will you just trust me with this? I've got this. And in that, I think Jesus in this passage basically says to them, here's three things (laughs) that you can believe in. Here's three things you can trust in when you're troubled that you'll see it through. First is his promise. God is a promise keeper, by the way. He makes promises and he keeps his promises. And what does he say here? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms If if that weren't true, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? What's the promise? 
that there's life beyond this life. That death is not the end of story. That there's something, folks, I'm not, I'm not sure we really get it as followers of Jesus, as, as those who put our hope and trust in God, that we will live eternally with God, with a brand new body. I'm kind of excited about that. I don't know about you. <laughs> this one's getting worn out, <laughs> right? Huh? And how exciting that is that we get that new body and we're forever where there's no pain, no sorrow, none of that anymore. And, and that's what he's saying is, yeah, you're in this world, you will have troubles, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And not only overcome the world, he's overcome death. And that we will live eternally with him. That is a great promise that we have. And I love what it says there. He says, uh, he says if it were not so, would I have t not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And I thought, wow, he's been there a couple of thousand years getting it ready. It's going to be really nice. <laughs> huh? Going to be amazing that he's prepared this place for us. And I think that what that's saying is much like what the Apostle, Apostle Paul said. He says, the afflictions of this life, he doesn't negate them, and neither does Jesus. They both understood there are the afflictions. Paul talks about the sufferings, the suffering that is great in this life. But he says, they're nothing compared to the glory on the other side. That this life is like, boom, compared to the eternal glory. And that's why he said, Here's why you can have your heart not troubled because you have this promise. The other thing he said is that with that comes the provision for the promise. Because he says, he said, if it not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare that place for you, I'll come again. And I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. How do you get to that place? He gets you there. Can you trust him in that? You bet you can. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, on those occasions where I've tried to speak with people about their eternity. And can I tell you, sometimes, I confess it too, sometimes we do a better job of that than others. You know, it's not particularly good to just say to someone, hey, by the way, do you know whether you're going to hell or not when you die? <laughs> not a great way to start a conversation with someone about their eternal destiny, okay? But you could always say something like, so what are your beliefs about life after this life. You see? But often when I ask people that question and ask them if they have a sense about their eternal destiny, do you know what I hear? Probably what you hear. Well, I'm trying to be a good person. How many of you have heard somebody say that? In some effect, I'm trying to be a good person. I, I think I'm okay. Or I hope so. I actually had a guy say, if I'm lucky enough, if I'm lucky enough, you know what Jesus was saying? It's a promise. It's a promise. And you can count on me to get you there. I'll take you there myself. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that the kind of thing that could help settle a troubled heart, troubled spirit. Hmm? But here's the key to this passage. He's not just given a promise. 
talking about a provision. It's about a person. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. And that person is the great I am. Did you notice what he says there? <laughs> I love it. Thomas, how, how many of you feel like Thomas some days? Huh? Yeah, I'd say at least 50-50, all right? <laughs> but Thomas, I love it. Jesus says, and you know the way where I am going. Now leave it to Thomas to say, oh, really? Really? Uh, maybe the other guys do. <laughs> Probably the other guys were thinking the same thing, only Thomas had the courage to say it. But Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am. I don't miss that. Jesus said, I am. You remember when Israel was coming out of Egypt and God raised up Moses to lead them? And God spoke to Moses. And Moses said, well, um, I'm not sure they're going to listen to me. <laughs> Who should I say sent me? And what did God say? You just tell him I am. Just tell him I am sent you. I am is back. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was saying, here's, what, here's why you can have this confidence when you're in troubled waters. Because of my promise, because of my provision, but because I am. That's why believe in God, believe also in me, because we're the same. And we are, I am. And he says, I am the way. You know, it's amazing. I've even heard Christians say, yeah, Jesus came to show us the way. Jesus came to point us the way. No, he didn't. That's our job, is to show the way, to point the way. Jesus said, I am the way. Big difference. He was not a way. He was the way to the Father. And when I think of the way, what I think of is he was access to God. He was access to intimacy with God. Because you see, sin separates us from God, and sin creates a barrier between us and God. And the Bible says that Jesus has broken down that dividing wall, that Jesus has conquered the law of sin and death that has separated us from God. And that we can have intimacy. When he said, I'm the way, I'm the way back. I'm the way back to that intimacy with the Father again. And you all remember when Jesus was on the cross, and as he died on the cross, the veil in the temple, which separated the Holy of Holies from the common folks, that that veil was torn from top to bottom. And I think in a lot of ways, as that veil was ripped apart, God was saying, now come in, everyone, come in. I think in some ways God was saying, and I'm coming out. <laughs> Get ready, here I come. Emmanuel. Yes, that's what this is about. And we have access. Because Jesus is the way. He also is the truth. Again, he didn't say, I've come to show you the truth. I've come to teach you the truth. He said, I am the truth. What do you think of when you think of truth? You know what I think of because I think of the words of Jesus. Jesus said, if you're my disciple, you'll abide in my word and you'll know the truth and the truth will what? It'll set you free. 
It'll make you free. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. It's so powerful. Jesus sets us free. He brings freedom to us. You see, in many ways, we're in bondage to some hideous lies. Hideous lies in counseling. Sometimes we refer to it as root lies that we bought into that are actually given direction to our lives where God has brought truth. And with that truth comes freedom from the bondage of that lie. I don't know if you've ever heard me mention uh, the course Experiencing God more than a few dozen times, all right? But I think it's one of the finest things ever written. And Henry Blackaby, I believe God inspired him to write that down. But in that course, he says this, you have not heard the truth about your circumstances until you've heard from Jesus. Because when you hear the truth from Jesus, it's liberating. It's life-giving. And so often, we walk around in these lies, lies like, oh, I could never do that, or lies like, oh, God could never love me, or I, I mean, I'm just telling you, I've heard these lies from people over and over again. God could never forgive me of that, or I could never do, or, or, or I could never change. How many times have you ever heard people say that? Well, Jesus is the life changer, and he is the one who can forgive all things, and he is actually the one, now hang on, who can enable you to do more than you ever thought you could. Mm. That's the other thing I love about experiencing God because have you ever heard someone say, well, I could never do that? How many times have you ever heard someone say that? How many times have you ever heard yourself say that? I could never do that. I could never be worshiply or like Brad. In fact, Brad said that right before we asked him. <laughs> <laughs> and Henry Blackaby says in his course, he says, whenever we say I could never do that, he said, we're actually saying more about what we believe about God than what we believe about ourselves. Do you understand that? Because you're really saying God could never use you in that way. God could never equip you. In that way, God could never empower you in that way. I'm telling you, Brad, and me too, neither one of us could be up here if it were not for the Spirit of God and his empowering, his enabling. Do you see? And so with truth comes a freedom from sin, from bondage, and freedom for ministry and service that we never thought possible because Jesus is the truth about those things. And he is the life. Mm. He is that life. And that life is abundant. And that life, I believe the Bible's talking about, it's now and it's forever. Honestly, I think we've made a mistake in the church. Now, not here, of course. Not Santa Bell Community Church. I want to be clear about that. But the church, you know, the other guys, okay? I think we've made a mistake in the church. Maybe talking so much about the life to come that we've neglected to talk about what Jesus does in our lives now. Hmm? You see, that journey of eternal life, Jesus said eternal life is knowing God. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that you would know God, that you would know Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And that knowing, that intimate relationship would change everything 
going forward. That life begins the moment you enter in to that relationship with him. That peace comes now. That joy comes now. And you see how that ministers to a troubled heart now is knowing that we have that relationship, that abundant life with him now. So here's the take home. The awakening truth, I mean. <laughs> the awakening truth is pursue the Prince of Peace and live. He invites us to this table to meet with him, to focus on him. In Hebrews, it says, fix your eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. Do you ever get distracted from your relationship with God? Anybody? I, this week I saw the movie How the Grinch Sold, Stole Christmas. How many of you have seen How the Grinch Stole Christmas? I am not recommending it. I actually thought it was a little weird in some parts for sure. But, uh, but the message that Dr. Seuss <laughs> originally wanted to communicate and the movie communicates, in fact, the theme song in the movie is, Where are you, Christmas? Where are you, Christmas? That somehow in the midst of the tinsel and the dinners and the presents, that somewhere... Christmas got lost altogether. Can that happen to us? Can we get so caught up in the going here and there and the family this and that and the dinner this and what am I going to get, Aunt Mabel and all that stuff that somehow we lose our pursuit of the Prince of Peace, the I Am who can bring us peace? You know, it was cool. I was blessed to be in that final room and walk through Bethlehem. Some of you didn't recognize me, but that was me. But I was, and I was behind curtain number one. <laughs> and I loved it because here's the cool thing is when the lights went off, it was almost like people forgot we were back there. So I got to hear lots of comments. I wish I could have a curtain like that in every one of your homes. <laughs> Just saying, well, I think I wish that, okay? But it's so cool as people are going out, the comments, and the, here's the comment that I heard it again and again. I want to stay here. I just want to stay here. So in the midst of all the lights and tinsel and noise and all of it, when they see the Prince of peace. They just want to stay. And so that's what I would encourage us, to take those times to stay. So here's the take home, but it's really to come to the table. Is first, believe then. Put your hope and trust in him. And I just want to say, if you're here today and you've never done that, you've never said, well, Lord, I am going to trust you. I'm going to trust you for my now, and I'm going to trust you for my eternity. I believe you died for me. I believe you can forgive sin. I believe you can give a new start. I would just encourage you in your own words, in your own way, to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you. Please come into my heart and save me. Forgive me. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Just in your own, God loves it when you just tell it like it is. And just tell him honestly. And I love what the word says in Romans. It says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I love it. It goes on to say, and will in no way be disappointed. Isn't that cool? And no way be disappointed. Can I tell you? You won't be disappointed to put your hope and trust. But also know this. Some of you are in trouble. 
Some of you are troubled right now, whether it's about health, finances, family, whatever it may be. And God is saying, will you trust me? Will you believe in me to be big enough to bring the best out of this? And then as, as you believe, then is to receive that. Receive his gift. Receive his promise that he is with you in the midst of that. And I had to put this on here because it's Christmas. Then give. You know, God blesses us so we can be a blessing. I don't know about you, but I noticed how many times the word glory (laughs) is there in John. I mean, it's all over the place. And what does that mean? Glory means shine. Glory means make known to the world. Don't just keep it to yourself. There's a whole lot of other people in trouble, too. Hmm? Share Jesus with them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for this sweet time of Bethlehem when we're reminded, Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, let the wind of Bethlehem blow through our hearts today as we renew that love relationship with you. Lord, I thank you that we can come to this table now and we can have this intimate meal with you and know that you say to us, let not your heart be troubled to trust you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.